Thanks everybody for coming. Um, we're definitely um, very, oops, all right, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, we're very pleased to have you here and we're um, eager to tell you a little bit about standby generators um, using propane fuel and um, all about the trend that's emerging of how you can get some extra revenues by installing standby generators in your new construction or remodeling projects and also a little bit about sizing the generators and selecting the right one for the application. Hey Melody, do you mind if uh, I explain why I'm here as well? Is uh, Melody, of course, is directly from Kohler, and you are gonna have a treat because if you want a wealth of knowledge about generators, this is the lady to go to. Wow, it sounded like an airplane coming by for a second. But anyway, the reason why I'm here is I'm a master pipe fitter, and that's an important key to these standby generators because they're not running on gasoline. They're running on natural fuels, propane gas, or natural gas, and that's a self-heating fuel. So this is a whole different animal, and Melody's gonna get into it, than a portable generator. Excellent. And by, um, the goal of this situation is to talk about the trends that are emerging that's um, increasing the demand for standby generators. Um, we're also going to talk about the types of generators available for residential applications. Um, we're going to talk about the um, sizing of a um, standby generator. And then we're also going to talk about the fuel choices that are available. So that's what we're going to cover. And um, we'll also allow time for questions afterwards if there's anything specifically you would like to um, follow up on. So basically, if you're sitting down here and you've never seen a standby generator, when you leave, you're going to be an expert, and it's going to open, open up a whole different world for you. So this is a very exciting presentation. And we'll start out right away with um, why are people demanding standby generators? Well, there's a lot of outages out there. And uh, a couple of the causes of outages, the number one cause is weather. Um, but the number two cause that's also become a big concern um, is the power grid. And it's in a very aging power grid, so there's a lot of issues there as well. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of a um, brief of the different weather conditions, some of them sound obvious, but lightning strikes, heavy snow, ice storms, hurricanes, um, all the um, flooding, all of that can cause um, power outages. To get into some of the two big ones, the first one is hurricanes. Um, some of the recent hurricane activity has caused a lot of awareness of the need for backup power because people have had to live without power for a very long time. Um, you had Hurricane Ike that really made an impression on some people um, with over 7 million people out of power, some of them for a month. They had no power whatsoever in their homes and were suffering through that. But the other thing Hurricane Ike did was it raised awareness that hurricanes aren't just about coastal cities. Um, this started in Texas, but it actually swept right up through the Midwest into Canada. And that um, actually knocked out a million people in Ohio, right in the middle of the country, were without power due to a hurricane. So um, hurricanes are not just about coastal cities. And um, I can tell you that Ohio had a surge in demand for generators after people had to live for weeks without any backup power. Well, one thing I can add to that is when Hurricane Katrina hit, I was uh, down there uh, within the year of the storm. We were doing some follow-ups to, uh, to see how the community was recovering. And yes, naturally the houses right on the coast got hit and they were totally wiped out. But what helped bring down the whole city was the fact that power was lost all along Mississippi and all along New Orleans. And when that infrastructure, your electrical system shuts down, that's when the city is going to go into chaos. Right. And, and that's what's raising awareness. I mean, people can think about this and think, yes, it would be nice not to have to live without power. But once they have had to live without power, they know they don't want to go through it again. So if you're doing any construction in areas where they have suffered those power outages, you're going to find a very receptive audience to understanding why they need a generator to back up their home. And the bad news, I'm a New England boy myself. So I can tell you, in this area, we get it all. We get the hurricanes, we get the ice storms, the wind storms, the flooding. So if there's ever an area in this country country, Melody, where these standby generators are going to be important, it's right here. And you're absolutely right, which leads into the ice storms, which have really created a surge of demand here in New England. Um, ice storms are compounding because you not only have the vast numbers of people who have been ex um, affected by the outage, but you also have that cold weather outside, which is dangerous for the people inside sh shivering because they don't have any heat anymore. But it's also dangerous even if they um, leave their home to go find a warm place to stay, their home is left behind with pipes that can freeze and cause tons of damage to the house. It's very expensive.
expensive they can have, bursting pipes, water damage, etc. So um, those are things that um, definitely, once somebody's lived through that, again, they understand that they need an insurance policy against that, and that's where they um, turn to a standby generator so they don't have to worry about it anymore. And then getting back to uh, the portable one, which we're going to get into more detail, but now think about it. If a storm comes, the last place you want to be is outside in that storm trying to set up a generator. And this is the importance of planning, and it's the importance of having a piece of equipment mounted to the house ready to go for you at any time. The next thing we're going to talk about is the second most common um, cause of these big outages that are raising awareness is the power grid. And as most of you know, there are... Um, issues with the power grid, to say the least. Um, but the, um, just the concept of power, um, electricity cannot be stored. So what that means is that um, for a, power is used within a second of when it's generated. And that means that there has to be a very fine balance between the uh, supply and the demand. And if that balance is disrupted, a surge on either demand or supply, it's going to cause an issue with the power station and it may knock out a section of the grid. Um, they try to knock out a section actually so they can isolate the problem and correct it, but sometimes it affects all of the other um, power plants in the grid and creates a cascading effect. Um, the power outage in the Northeast of 2003 is one that a lot of people remember because it affected 50 million people. That power outage started with just one tree in Ohio hit a high voltage line. That shut down the um, local grid in Ohio, but it was also sensed by a power um, station in Canada. And that sent 250 power plants went down, leaving 50 million people without power, all because of one tree in Ohio. So that's some of the um, fragile nature of our power grid. Well, well, can you see where we're going with this? All right, let's say the weather's perfect. There's no storms anywhere. You even have a chance, and a good chance, of a power failure occurring just from the electric plant itself not being able to produce it or having a failure. So on both sides of the equation, folks, it's going to be imminent that you will at some time experience a, a power failure very sooner than, than much later. And so um, people are wondering, is the power grid going to get better? Well, actually, it's probably going to get worse. Most of the power grid, 40% um, of it is over 40 years old. Um, as far as demand for electricity, it's only going up. We're becoming more and more dependent on electricity in our homes. Um, they expect an increase of 18% demand on electricity just in the next 10 years. And the, um, the improvements on the grid are only going to be about 8.4%. So again, you see a disparity where the demand is already exceeding what they're going to be doing for improvements. And then over the next 30 years, they're expecting a 30% um, increase in demand. So again, the, the grid has some challenges. And what this all means, folks, is the industry is changing. Let's face it, we all know it. And what you're gonna see with everything that we've been talking about now in the future coming up and home building itself changing, I'll guarantee you within the next decade, you'll see standby generators permanently and just regular pieces of equipment installed to houses because these are going to be standard pieces of equipment, just like a central air conditioner is now, these standby generators will be part of our homes in the future. Right. So that leads us into, with all of these outages occurring, what are the costs of the outages? Um, it's easy to focus on the homeowner, which we will also do, but it even has um, some costs for somebody in construction. Um, if you get a power outage uh, when you're nearing completion on a project, it can cause all kinds of frustrations and delays, which can cost you money. But if you have a completed home that ha is on the market, it hasn't been sold, you can run all kinds of risks from a power outage. Your cooling system may not work, so you may have mold issues in within the house. Um, if it's in the cold areas, again, your pipes may have issues. You may have freezing pipes causing damage. Um, but you also may have um, issues with a vacant home having security issues. And again, the security system will not work during um, a power outage. So those are some of the things that can actually affect the builder before the home even gets to the homeowner. But then we get to the homeowner, and that's where the demand is coming from. The first thing most people think about is the refrigerator, because everybody knows after about four hours, um, your refrigerator is going to um, not have safe food in it anymore but they also have the freezer. People are thinking about the spoilage of food, how much that food costs. 
um, to replace, and a lot of people think that's reason enough alone. But the other cost um, of losing all of that food is that during an emergency, that may be one of the most important resources that the family in the house has. If it spoils, now they no, no longer have the food. Rotting food can attract vermin, rodents. Um, that's an issue, and um, it's just not a, a safe thing to have. So you don't want that food to spoil. But there are a lot more issues than that. <laughs> Heat waves are a huge um, danger for um, particularly the elderly or people with ha health issues. There's actually been thousands of deaths each year due to power outages when a heat wave is occurring. So um, the safety of keeping your climate controlled is, is important, not just for heat, but also for cold. Well, Melly, you, you made a really good point when you mentioned uh, some elderly people maybe living at home whose life depends on the air conditioning. Folks, as never before, we have more special need people living in our homes now. We have more home businesses operating from our homes. We're all plugged into the internet. We're a plugged in society. So years ago, when you lost power, if, uh, let's say it was for a day or two, well, you broke out the board games, you had some candles, some canned food, you could get through it. Being a plugged in society now, we can no longer afford to be one, two, three days without food three days without electrical power for air conditioning because now it could become a matter of, of life and death. 